behalf of our thought leadership community, I'm excited to be able to introduce you to Mark Barden. Mark is a Brit who has spent the majority of his career in the United States based in Northern California. He's a founding partner in Eat Big Fish, the consulting firm that coined the term challenger brand to define an unconventional approach to brand building that helps ambitious underdogs eat the big fish. Prior to that, in the late 1990s, he started his own agency to help Yahoo rise to power. And then as head of marketing, he took a company public during the dot-com era. His work sits at the intersection of creativity, culture, and branding. And he's developed a keen eye for how anyone can boost their own inventiveness with the right mindset, method, and motivation, which he will discuss with us today. So let's give him a warm Renaissance Executive Forum's global welcome to Mark Barton. Mark, welcome to our community. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm just going to... Uh... Does that look good? Yeah, great. So um, I'm going to talk to you about beautiful constraints this morning and not just talk to you about them, but actually describe to you um, how you might be able to transform your own limitations into advantages. It's the body of work that we've been working on at Eat Big Fish now for probably about eight years all in. The flow today is going to look something like this. So I'm going to begin by defining what I mean by beautiful constraints and hopefully articulating for you why you should care about them. I think that'll become apparent very quickly. So I'll be establishing some of the key idea here that I want to talk about. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about process. So what can I actually do in my own business coming right out of this session? I've got some tools and templates baked into this uh, presentation today that will articulate for you the mindset, the method and the motivation that re is required to succeed in a world of limitations. It'll take about 30 minutes to do that, allowing plenty of time for discussion. You can ask questions. I'd love to hear your own stories actually about how you've been able to uh, turn um, uh, constraints into beautiful opportunities for your business and then we'll, then we'll close. So that's roughly the plan today. As I mentioned, um, one of the things that might be really useful is, as I go through the presentation today, um, I won't be able to stop and, and answer questions uh, in real time. So if you, but if you do have questions or observations or insights of your own, park them into chat. Uh, Rick's volunteered to uh, keep an eye on that. And then we can use that to uh, start the ball rolling when we get to the discussion piece. And it'd be great for me to hear what you have to say about things. All right, so let me begin just, I mean, Rick gave a nice intro about who we are. Um, I think it's an important part of this story. So 21 years ago, Eat Big Fish was birthed and you can see from this company logo, what we're all about It's the little fish eating the big fish. So this isn't just about small companies taking on big companies because a lot of our work actually has been with quite big companies. But the idea here is if you have ambitions that exceed what you might normally be expected to achieve given your resources, that's what makes you a challenger. You're ambitious to change the category, to shake the odds in your favor and do more with less. And that's the founding idea behind our business. And so we ended up in a lot of conversations with brands that weren't really big or really well resourced. And exhibit A, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of Eat Big Fish to some degree and tell you a story. And this is the genesis of, of our thought process here. So in 2002, we were called by a Unilever brand called Surf. This is a value detergent in their portfolio. So they're competing with Tide, you know, the big Goliath from Procter & Gamble that just dominates the marketplace. And they had some really big ambitions. They were, you know, it's Unilever versus Procter & Gamble is a a timeless contest goes on all over the world. And they'd been set the target of increasing their sales by 20%. And when we met the brand team, they said, look, it's just impossible, Mark. We can't, we, our product doesn't uh, work in, as well as Tide. We don't have the expensive cleaning enzymes in, in our product because we're a value detergent. We're trying to meet a cost of goods that's significantly below Tide. So they had a very, um, 
hangdog expression, shall we say, of just not knowing how to get started here. Um, and what was powerful in that moment, and I'm, I'm going to you know, tell a story that took maybe three months to play out in about 30 seconds here, was that what that allowed us to do, the fact that they had big ambition and a significant constraint, was we couldn't look at incremental improvements to the way things have been done historically on that brand. It just wasn't going to get us there. So we had to question just about everything that was in the world of surf at the time. And it got us to a place where we said, let's not even try to compete on cleaning. Let's compete on other uh, criteria of choice in the category by introducing sensory experience. So this is the first time that uh, inclusions had ever been used in laundry. So this little uh, petals that were put into the product. The, um, there was incredible amount of uh, perfumes and fragrances borrowed from another part of Unilever. It already existed. All they had to do was bring it in and drop it into their product. Um, and so it forced them to compete on a very different um, set of criteria, which, had, which transformed this brand and put it on a growth track that was so steep that Unilever actually had to cap uh, its growth uh, models because it's starting to cannibalize some of their premium brands. So it's a really good example, I think, of just very early on in the history of Eat Big Fish about, wait a second, um, by deciding that the constraint was actually, we had to really embrace it and, and have a, a, a conversation about what it was trying to tell us about how to compete, got us to this completely different uh, space. Much copied ever since. So now you walk into any supermarket anywhere in the world, you'll see brands competing on sensories and fragrance, but Surf was the one that got it started. Another example, this is maybe 10 years later. So, uh, the, you know, eBig Fish is now collecting examples of situations where the constraint turned out to be a real blessing in disguise. Uh, this is a guy called Charles Van S. He was a young brand manager working on a tiny British beer called Newcastle Brown Ale, trying to sell it to the Americans. So it's American, British beer brand in America. We'd worked with him on this positioning around no bollocks. Uh, no bollocks, if you're British, it's quite a rude uh, statement. It's almost like a swear, it's like an American version bullshit, basically. So we've got a really compelling proposition for the brand. The brand is gonna go out and take on the world. Charles is very excited and he goes, look, beer in America has to appear on the Super Bowl to succeed. How do we get on the Super Bowl? And everybody looked at him as if to say, Charles, you do realize that your entire marketing budget is less than a Super Bowl commercial is gonna cost you. Nevertheless, Charles said, look, I really wanna do this, I wanna tackle this. Let's be creative guys about how we might get this done. And I'll show you what the solution is. I'm hoping this works. It worked in rehearsal, let's see. Something to celebrate the new home. Oh, Newcastle Brown Ale. Hard to believe we met on match, and a year later, we're moving in together. I love these floors. They're Armstrong flooring. Oh, you know what else I love? This Gladiator Garage Works Chillerator Refrigerator. It's tough enough for the garage, but it's stylish enough for the home. Oh. I'll find a repairman on the YP app, an easy way to connect with great local That business. phone looks as great as my jockey boxer briefs feel. Well, it's from Boost Mobile. Uh-oh. Come to data. may not be used to Charisma bedding, the choice for the discerning bed and bath customer. Mr. Cheezo is a wholesomely crunchy on the go cheese snack. Hashtag gluten free, hashtag cashew. Rotel, a zesty blend of diced tomatoes and green. Conquer the tough stuff with brawny paper towels. <laughs> like what you see? It's all from Sharper Image. Wilted Northern, Hunt's Tomatoes, Dixie Plates, and. Oh! Bunny goes bean chips. Back thread. Thank you. Today. Crave jerky, snack better, crave better, vanity fair nap. Of course, pickles. New cap. brown ale, my favorite. So the solution turned out to be um, the way to get Newcastle Brown Ale. I'm going to celebrate the new home. Onto the Super Bowl. I'll just see if I can advance to the next slide here. Whoops. <laughs> Hang on. Technical difficulties. There we go. Um, was to reach out to literally a hundred other challenger brands. Everybody pitched in a small check, tens of thousands of dollars from their marketing budget, and they all appeared on the Super Bowl together. So a really great example of just being refusing to accept that the lack of budget, the lack of something that you just feel intuitively, this is what you need to compete in the American beer market, was going to be a hurdle to holding back 
uh, this brand. And phenomenal success, not just because the spot itself was kind of created, but it was the months ahead of the Super Bowl where hashtag band of brands became a cultural phenomenon where everybody was trying to see would Newcastle Brown Ale be able to attract enough brands to de uh, develop the budget to put, put their, themselves into, into the Super Bowl. Great example. So, you know, by this point, and this is really a bit of an overstatement because it makes it look like we had a sudden epiphany when in actual fact, it was a very slow hunch that developed over time. But we'd never have got to this kind of creative idea unless there'd been a significant limitation at the get-go. And so maybe constraints can be the impetus for inventing better solutions than we would have created in the first place. And this is the big idea, I suppose, of this body of work. Those things that you think of today as limiting your success can, in fact, inspire new ways to grow your business. Uh, and that was the impetus for doing uh, 40 unique interviews. We had a PhD student in Amsterdam review the academic literature on how exactly is it working that uh, limitations inspire creativity in, in people. So we really did a great trawl of the literature, our own work, a bunch of new studies um, to create this body of work. What's happened since then, as you're all, all too familiar, is that the world has changed significantly. And I love this phrase, it appeared in the book, but it seems all the more relevant now, VUCA. This is an American military term to describe modern warfare. Uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now, if that feels like a description of the category in the marketplace that you're competing in today, welcome to the club. This is kind of always the case for challenges that their world is volatile, uncertain, chaos, uh, complex and, and ambiguous. But now that's true for all of us. And so increasingly, this ability to work productively with constraints is becoming a competitive advantage for those who can master it over those who can't. Yeah, I mean, 2020, it's not been a great year, has it really? Um, <laughs> it's thrown up one constraint after another, after another, after another. And I'm sure that you've got your own version of that or your own regional flavors, as well as the kind of global pandemic that we're all experiencing together. Um, and so we've begun to publish more and more content around companies and brands and people that we see embracing the opportunity and the constraints. So right now on one of our websites is thechallengerproject.com. There are 13 inspiring responses to the coronavirus crisis, including, for example, a food delivery brand called Olio in the UK. On their app that neighbors could cook a relatively low cost for them for their out of work neighbors and deliver it to, um, their, to their doorsteps. We all know, I suspect, about the brewers. You know, we ran out, if you remember, the world ran out of um, sanitizing alcohols and all the world's brewers kind of at, almost at once had this realization that they could create that. So people leaned into the opportunity there and started to create not only things to help the world during COVID crisis, but help world ways to build their brand reputation. I'm going to talk to you about this one bottom right hand corner. I could have spoken about a number of these, but this is one called um, the Crosstown Collective. So if you look down at this image on the bottom left hand corner, this is a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs, a couple of guys who'd started a donut shop in the UK. So for whatever reasons, donuts and coffee has become quite fashionable in London. It's quite unfashionable in the US where I live, quite fashionable. They'd opened 13 stores. They're doing really well. All the hipsters are going in there and getting their beards full of donut crumbs. Life is good until COVID happened and the UK locked down very quickly. Now you're staring at a situation you're probably going to go out of business, right? Within 48 hours, they had a website up for delivering not just their donuts, but down the bottom right hand corner here, a collection of local artisans. So they've got uh, Oatly soy milk in there. They've got a nose to tail um, butcher shop that will deliver meat. They've got uh, fresh fruit and vegetable from local, local farmers. So they've created this delivery uh, program that is not just a nice solve for them, but it's actually a bigger business opportunity. So out of lockdown came a completely different business model 
a whole set of new partnerships and massive growth of their company. So that's, you know, a real time issue from 2020 of how to take constraints and make them beautiful, make them the source of inspiration to how to grow your business. And as we look forward, I'm sure you're all arriving at these kind of conclusions already. These are US based headlines, but I suspect it's the case where you are, which is how long is this recession going to be? What kind of impact is it going to have on supply chain, on distribution, on consumer mindset? You know, things just aren't going to go back to normal. And so the normal way of us going to market and thinking about growth for our business is not going to be there for us either. And so we have to fight fire with fire. What are some strategies for surviving in this VUCA world? My um, proposal is that it's having a productive relationship with all the constraints that are going to pop up for you. Um, and so now I'm going to talk to you about mindset, method, and motivation. Let's start unpacking. So what do I do, Mark? Uh, what do I do? And the first place to start is to ask yourself in a really honest conversation with you and your leadership team, perhaps, about what is our relationship to constraints? What's our mindset? So, you know, the boss walks into the office and goes, guys, uh, that key ingredient that we used to get from China, we can't get it anymore. That factory shut down. Or... Um, we've got three SKUs in our lineup. We usually support all three of them. There's only enough budget to support two, but that third one, we still want you to hit your numbers. What would you say? Would you react? As I would, quite reasonably, with this kind of mindset. And this is a very real story for me because we have a business that is about flying to different cities around the US, assembling teams of 20 to 30 people for multi-day workshops, face-to-face, solving these kinds of problems together. Lockdown is an existential threat to our business. So I know exactly what that feels like. We call this the victim mindset, right? Where you just immediately shrink from the challenge. Um, and there's really three kinds of phases, I suppose, a journey that people go on, including ourselves. I'm happy to say that our business is not only we're probably going to have our best year this year because we've been able to pivot onto Zoom and the world's figured out that it needs what we offer. So everything's fine for us. Uh, but nevertheless, you start with the victim mindset, right? Which is, uh oh, that happened. Let's reduce our ambitions. Maybe we'll give up. Maybe we'll put in a number that's, you know, 3x lower than we expected to hit. That's victim mindset. Totally understandable. Lots of human, you know, fight or flight kicks in when you're challenged and you shrink from it. Pretty soon, most of us, it's human nature, it's to roll up our sleeves and dig in and maybe find a way around the obstacle. We call this the neutralizer mindset, which is, yeah, we can clue together something and, and figure out something, maybe we'll get close to our targets. But how many of us start on the right-hand side of this page, which is the transformer mindset, which is to say, okay, that happened. In that problem, in that constraint, is an opportunity for us to rethink the way that we do business and could actually lead to opportunities for significant growth. And so the first thing to say is you need to figure out, have that conversation with yourselves about where are we? Are we victims? How do we get to neutralizer? And do we believe that we can get all the way to the right hand side of this page into this transformer mindset of productively engaging with the limitations and finding out where the opportunities are? And so three questions. Do we believe it's possible? Do we know how to start? And how much do we want to do it? A really important question is to just, you know, Friday afternoon, over, however you choose to do it on Zoom calls, is to have these conversations together. Um, do we believe it's possible? Sorry, I'll just go back one. This is about having a positive mindset, a can-if culture. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is really productive is to get people to talk about when this may have happened in the past, either in your own business or maybe in your personal life or in a company that you used to work at. Start telling each other the stories. There's a great quote I'm fond of from Timothy Wilson, the psychologist who said, we are the stories we tell ourselves. So let's start by telling ourselves stories about how we've been able to do this in the past and start to understand that we can do this. Then you need some kind of method. I'm gonna walk you through that method in a moment. We need some handholds here, some scaffolding to get started. And then we need to understand how to keep each other motivated through the hard yards ahead. These, these constraints don't yield in the first session that you run. You may need to go back again and again and again and keep pushing and keep pushing. 
And leadership is about telling stories and creating vivid pictures of the consequences. Guys, if we can figure this out in the next three to six months, while all our competitors are going out of business, we'll have the category to ourselves when things come back. For example, it's a very positive way to feed your teams the fuel of motivation to keep going through the difficult times ahead. So there is a six step process. I've talked to you about victim neutralizer transformer. Now I'm going to talk to you about number two, three and four, path dependence, asking propelling questions and kind of thinking just so that you can walk away from this call with those tools in your back pockets to get started if this if this feels like a good place for you. So path dependency, let me define what I mean by that. This is a, a concept from the academic literature in the world of, of, of business management. And this defines the habits and assumptions. Um, I'm just going to move you guys over there. About how the business and the category works that are baked into our current approach. So this is the current way that you think about going to market, the way you think about how your business operates. Some of those will need to be challenged or they will prevent you from seeing the opportunity to leverage constraints. So if you just think about running the business in the same way that you've always run it, you are path dependent. And that path dependency, or we always do it this way, is that it will blind you from finding new ways to engage productively with constraints. Um, this is a woman called Grace Hopper. She's the, the most senior leader in the US Navy as a woman who said the most dangerous phrase in the, in the language is, we've always done it this way. And so the beginning stage of this process is to ask yourself, well, we've always done it this way, but is that still the right way for the times we live in? And so we've created this acronym, BREAK, um, as a way of just structuring that thought process. So again, find an opportunity to sit down with your teams and talk about, well, what are our biases about how we go to market here? For example, is it true that in order to win in cleaning, you need to have superior cleaning performance? Clearly not. That was the insight behind the the surf um, case study I took, took you through. So biases and beginning assumptions, routines and processes, the way we do things, the external resources, always that vendor, always that distribution partner. Should, is it time to rethink some of that? Is it time to ask our associates internal? Put together that delivery box because one of the founding partners of the donut shop knew how to put up websites really quickly. And so they leveraged that internal resource and different KPIs. So different ways of rethinking um, our business and how it works. This is a um, you know one page handout. You could print this off. You could hand it out to your folks. You could start jotting some notes and you could have a great rich conversation about what aspects of your current business model you need to break for the new constrained times into which we're heading. That could be a really productive conversation. Reveal all kinds of um, arcane furniture cluttering up your mind that you need to get rid of in order to think newly. The next tool is to leverage what we call a propelling question. So rather than let the, the constraints kind of sit over there and ignore them, we're bringing them into the center of the conversation and we're doing something quite counterintuitive which is we're coupling them with the bold ambition. Again, think about that surf story I led off with. If it had said maintain market share with, a, with poor cleaning performance, they wouldn't have done anything different. It would have been incrementally tuning. But because they'd been given a bold ambition by their leadership, they had to rethink things. So a propelling question helps you get there. It's a different kind of question that makes the constraint a part of the solution, not just the problem. And it propels you towards different kinds of answers you wouldn't get to uh, without asking a propelling question. So we're not starting with ideation. We're starting with real clarity over what the question is that we need to answer. Here's the three examples. So surf, how can we increase by 20% the sales of a laundry detergent that doesn't clean as well as the leading brand? For Newcastle Brown Ale, how can we run an ad in the Super Bowl when the cost is more than my entire marketing budget? Crosstown Collective, how can we increase household penetration when all 13 of our stores must close? Now, these questions, what makes them interesting is they look impossible when you first write them. And so what it means is that nobody's going to reach for the obvious solution. Uh, at Google, 
all of the businesses that aren't core businesses like search and 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 phones and and whatnot live in the moonshot factory and moonshots don't begin with brainstorming clever answers they say they start with the hard work of finding the right questions so it's true of little startup challenger brands who need to figure out ways to compete but it's increasingly a way that big companies are thinking about, well, what problems are out there that we need to solve? And in doing so, we'll, we'll have big businesses. Um, another person that we interviewed was the chief marketing officer of Discovery Health. This is a health insurance company in South Africa. He said, we ask ourselves impossible questions in order to settle for mildly possible solutions. I just love that. It's the idea of just raising the bar almost too high because you know that by reaching for it, you'll get to, to new places. Um, I won't walk you through this, but this is in the deck and you can, you can use this later perhaps to think about how you might create a couple or three propelling questions in your own business. Think about different families of ambitions, different constraints that are popping up in your business model today. Um, jot them down onto, you know, again, it's all pro forma stuff. We want to grow by X, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're, this, this requires, I won't present this to you because it requires you to really sit and think about this. But out of this, you can arrive at a couple of really interesting propelling questions that will force inventive thinking in, into your program. And there's, a, there's a, um, again, a, a template for thinking that through. The next thing we have to do, so at this point, we have... Um, acknowledge that it is possible to make these really uh, intimidating constraints opportunities for growth in our business. We've looked at our path dependencies and we've challenged, well, this could change now and this could change now and this could change now. So we've opened up new possibilities there. We've got a propelling question or three that are really impossible to do. We now need to have a way of starting a positive uh, conversation around how to answer those impossible questions with what we call canif thinking, right? So each, what this is born of is uh, these 40 interviews that we did and looking back through our database of, of uh, client case studies of our own, we said there tend to be about nine different ways of starting the conversation. We put them on this thing called a can if map. In the old days where we could meet face to face, we would print these out large, put them in the middle of a table and all stand around it and start scribbling ideas about well, we can answer that propelling question if we do it this way. Uh, just to give you a little bit more detail on what that looks like, it spells, of course, we're a consultancy, so we like acronyms. Transform. We can if we think of it as, if we remove something in our program to allow something else to come forward, if we access the knowledge of other people, institutions, organizations, if we introduce something new, if we substitute, blah, blah, you get how this works. Each one of these... Um, letters is a prompt to get your team started thinking through their solutions. Again, here, just to land that with you, here's what it looks like for SURF. We can if we substitute cleaning performance for sensory overperformance. For Newcastle Brown Air, we can if we use other people to fund it for us. Crosstown Collective, we can if we introduce an awesome delivery service partnering with other local brands. So there's their can if solution coupled to the propelling question. They look a lot, lot easier to come in the cold light of day after the fact than clearly they do when you're in the model of thinking it through. But nevertheless, that's the kind of clarity you want to get to. I'll close with uh, one last um, story here from IKEA. So one of the things that we got really interested in, Adam and I, as we were doing this piece of work, was to find big companies who seem to have designed a culture that was all about this. Nike's great at this, Unilever's great at this, IKEA is great at this, Discovery Health in South Africa. Their cultures are built around this. So this is a story about IKEA. And Ingvar Kamprad, who is the founder of IKEA, was notorious in the company for stalking the halls, thinking up impossible questions to give to his staff. You all know this brand well enough to know that they're trying to you know, introduce designer furniture into the world at almost impossible price points. And so he would say, as he was passing Julie's desk, Julie, I've got a project for you. This time next week, I want you to get together with Cindy and Carl, and we're going to have a conversation about how you build a fashionable table that you can sell for $7. And they all immediately say, 
they go to the victim mindset, which is, Ingvar, it's not possible. Seven dollars, that's just, I mean, it's just not, figure out a way. So rather than me explain how they did, I'm going to show you a piece of film now of a senior leader at Ikea talking about exactly that. If people don't have money and they want a table, uh, what is a, a reasonable price for a table? Maybe it's five euros. So if you say that I'm going to make a table for five euros, you can't do it by looking at the competitors because there are no tables for five euros and there will never be. You know, So you, you start building on the volumes, you look at the supply chain, you look at new materials, et cetera, et cetera. You probably will be looking not at wood, but at bamboo or something else like that. And I think a lot of the things like the blue bag at Ikea where you, uh, is actually made of bamboo fibers. And it was because the, at that time, the project was framed in such a way it would be impossible to produce these blue bags. constraints or restraints, then you have to be innovative and you have to actually ask other people within the organization. The design process is not a designer, it's a lot of people contributing with different competencies and it's also the supply chain contributing and uh, it may be even universities contributing with the research or whatever. And this kind of multidiscipline design approach I think is uh, the way a lot of innovative ideas and products products have been uh, developed i think you know one of the things that's great about ikea is um oh, i think it's going to go back and play it again is just um how excited the people are there about answering these impossible questions because they know it has always been at the heart of who they are going back to the very first insight that Ingvar Kamper had had when he passed the lumber yard and he saw the off all the you know uh, remnant pieces of wood that being tossed out and said I can make furniture out of that uh, and that ethos has stayed alive in the company to this very to this day but there are other organizations too in Nike this I love this quote so Nike had this whole series of challenges around sustainability for example where their glues were turning out to be toxic uh, dyeing products was taking a huge amount of water and they were very conscious about uh, their environmental footprint as an existential threat to not just them but their entire industry and so they developed a really constructive mindset and this this quote here sums it up a series of one-offs has now crystallized into a core competence a journey from individual moments to a new way of thinking where we actually go hunting for constraints. So their belief in their own ability to identify and find opportunity and constraints ahead of the competition is what gives them the confidence to go ahead and, 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 and do exactly that. So um, it's not just about small, nimble entrepreneurs like the Crosstown Collective able to put up a website overnight to respond to Corona lockdown. It's about large organizations institutionalizing this way of thinking knowing full well that if they can do this better than the competition, they win hands down because constraints are coming up all of the time. So um, there's a book where all of these stories that I've been telling you about have been published in um, and it's going through, a, it's having a second wind right now. It came out in 2015, as you might imagine, COVID's given it new relevance. So uh, get a hold of that. There's the big idea. And the, the four key takeaways really are First of all, your mindset matters. So at the beginning, don't expect people to run into the room and go, yippee, something really bad happened. And allow them to go on a journey with you to say, look, we've seen this kind of stuff happening in the world. This is an opportunity. Can we get there together, guys? Let's talk about our mindset. Let's drop maybe some of the outdated habits about how we think our business works and choose this moment to be a way to reinvent. Let's ask propelling questions. Let's really think about, well, what is the kind of impossible brief that if we could answer it, would take us head and shoulders above the competition? Because we'll be finding all kinds of new different, and different ways to do it. And in order to start that, let's use this can-if thinking approach, which is let's abolish the negativity. Well, we can't do that because that vendor doesn't allow it or this retailer won't put us in. Let's abandon can't because let's use can-if 
to put oxygen and optimism into the conversation and allow us to eke our way towards some new kinds of solutions that we might not otherwise have found. Um, and that's that's all I'd like to say. I, I realize I've, I've said a lot. I've put a lot into, into these slides and I'm very happy to um, make a copy of this slide deck available to you all. Anybody who wants it can just email hello at eatbigfish.com uh, and we can send you this and maybe some other goodies too um, that will help you perhaps if you uh, are interested in this. So with that, I just hello at Eat Big Fish. I'm just gonna take this down now so I can see all your faces and open it up for, for questions. And we're using the chat for the questions. So if you have a question for Mark, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll be happy to bring it to his attention. Um, I'd like to, since I have the mic on, I'll, I'd like to start and just, since you have predominantly leaders of organizations here, CEOs, owners, um, the propelling question, can you help to give a sense for how a leader actually gets the organization initially to accept the idea that they should work on the propelling question rather than falling into maybe what would be a victim mindset behind his or her back. Yeah. And not really taking it seriously. Yeah. Well, and there's multiple ways to achieve that, Rick. I mean, we, we are big believers, you know, because our, our business model, our way of engaging with clients is in cross-functional workshops. So for me, the people that understand the aspects of the propelling question the best, what's the right way to frame the ambition? What are the constraints that we're facing are deeper into the organization. So for me, a great leader would stand up and say, look, clearly these are challenging times. The world has changed around us. It's creating all kinds of new challenges, limitations, constraints everywhere. I want to get really clear on what they are. So let's have a process through chat in Zoom calls or you know, more formal ways of doing that to bubble up what are the constraints that are existential threats to us today? And what are some of the big ambitions that maybe we can see out there in the world for us if we respond really well to those things? And let's start putting these together in new, newest, and let that be a process that just kind of um, happens. We'll just wait for a second and he's come back each time he's stopped the last a time unique moment in time where we can have that so you you break it down and do it that way i will say there's a, um, a great story too of paul polman the um ceo of unilever he's now i think he's um he's retired from that from that role but he was the ceo of unilever for a long time and he began his um uh, mission there by saying we're going to double uh, growth of Unilever in the next five years while halving our footprint. So massive increase in sales. Decrease. And at the time, he, and then we talked to um, the head of uh, supply chain at Unilever at great length about this because he said, when Paul stood up and made that statement, nobody knew how to get that done. But everybody totally bought into it because, of course, you want to work at a successful company. It's going to double growth. And they were becoming increasingly aware of their footprint in the world. And so it actually activated the culture because the people, the employees at Unilever were like, this is, I, you know, I'm feeling a little guilty about all the plastic bottles we're putting out in the world and, and on, and on, on and on and on, all the different ways that Unilever impacts uh, the sustainability agenda. But the fact that our CEO is asking us to engage with this question and he's pushing it down to us and saying, you guys go figure that out. I don't know what the answer is. I just know that's what we need to do was really energizing culturally for them. And then it kicked off a root and branch re-examination of every single aspect of their business. And if, if you're interested, I can give you two or three things that came out of that kind of conversation. So I think it's a combination of, you know, as a leader, if you, if you know you have the confidence of your team and you can see quite clearly what the propelling question is, put it out there. It can be incredibly stimulating. Uh, to your organization, particularly if it's something they're buying into. But equally, I think pushing it down into the organization, go, you guys are closer to the market. You know what the constraints are. Let's have a conversation about how to make those central to the creativity conversations we're having about strategy in our company, as opposed to ignoring them. You know, like the ugly stepchild you lock under the stairs, which is what most of us do. Ugh, ignore that. It's not going on. It's hard to think about that. Excellent. 
I uh, would like to open it up to the community. Does someone have a question directly to ask Mark? If so, unmute your microphone and feel free to ask. While they're getting ready to do that, I'd like you to maybe spend a minute and talk about identifying resources and assets. You talk about that in the book. You touched on it here, but maybe you could share uh, how a leader can help the organization to identify they have assets and resources during a time of constraint. Yeah, so there's there's one of the kind of stops on our wheel, uh, which I didn't get to today, uh, given time, is talk, talks about creating abundance. And so in a constrained world, it's really easy to get into that victim mindset where you just start seeing less and less opportunity. Most of us on any given day are within arm's reach, metaphorically speaking, of more resource than we need to get done what we need to get done. And it requires a really creative non-path, take the blinkers off and start thinking about all the people. I mean, so for example, just to make it real, the, the surf example, Right, so they're in the laundry business unit, but down the hall is the fragrances business unit and all the personal care products. And you're like, those guys have world-class fragrance. Nobody's using it. So just sitting down and making, if you, look, if you work in a large organization with lots of different aspects to your business, you're just making lists of the assets and equities that you have that you never think of as, 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 as assets and equities. Uh, when Virgin America launched over here in the US, now defunct, it's very, very large capital intensive business, right? Getting airplanes up in the air, very little marketing budget. But they saw their planes as media that flew through the air, right? So they had a conversation about we People want to be in relationship with Virgin. It's a cool brand. Um, we've got all these captured eyeballs. If you're on a 300 people on a plane all looking that way. How do we think of that as media? And so they ran uh, the world's first in-air fashion show in partnership with Victoria's Secret. So they reached out to Victoria's Secret, said, how would you like to have a fashion show in the sky? Because everybody's pulling their phones out, they're taking pictures, they're sharing on social media. There's your marketing impressions. But it came from thinking very differently about what is an aeroplane? It's a medium. How do we fill that media with content as opposed to, well, it's the way to get from A to B. So it does require quite creative thinking. So job one, make a list of all the assets and equities that you aren't seeing. I just worked with a financial firm. One of the things we did was we realized, they realized, big financial company, they have more PhDs working there, they thought, than at Google. So everybody thinks Google is this epic, super smart company, right? The smartest company on planet Earth. They said, no, actually, we've got more PhDs here working on, you know, quant stuff for the financial market. We're a smarter, let's, is that something we might be able to use to attract new talent to in our marketing? I guess this tiny example, but just creative thinking about all the assets that you have within use, and then a very, very creative approach to partnering. So the Crosstown Collective, if they tried to deliver just their donuts to people's houses, probably wouldn't have been a profitable business model. You start adding the meat and the milk and the vegetables into that. And all of those companies came very willingly to chip in and, and make that happen. So through those partnerships, they accessed the resources of lots of other people. So I think knowing that once you've got your propelling question, starting to think about, well, what kind of resources would we need to help us answer that propelling question? And having a really creative approach to, Who's out there that has an agenda that we can help them? We call this the mutually beneficial hustle of 21st century capitalism, right? So you know that, Rick, if, I, if you introduce me to this author and I'm gonna have a great conversation with him and he's gonna bring me into General Motors, that's good for him, that's good for me. I'm gonna circle back and you know, that this is how it works, right? We just, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And just having a more thoughtful, strategic approach to that as opposed to it being kind of uh, somewhat random. We have two questions, one's from Geronimo and then one's from Robert. The first one from Geronimo, maybe you touched on it. He was asking any experience related to travel and you touched on Virgin, but any other thoughts about uh, examples in the travel space? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a great Citizen M Hotels. I'll tell you a story about them. I presume some of you, if you're in that hospitality business, you know about Citizen M. So this is their kind of, um, 
startup hotel chain, um, they, the first thing that they did was to say, what are the five things that nobody cares about anymore about luxury hotels? You know, nobody needs the big French armoire at the bottom of the bed, so we'll get rid of that. You don't need dual sinks next to each other, his and hers, so we'll get rid of that. The things that people care about, super comfortable bed, super great technology, speedy check-in. So they were able to get rid of a bunch of stuff. But they, stick, and they, you know, they don't have a lot of money to start the, start, start, the, uh, start the chain with. They look at the lobbies and they go, we want to make it, if your room's kind of small, you want to spend some time hanging out in this cool lobby. So how do we make this the coolest lobby when we can't afford to you know, spend a fortune on furniture? So they reached out to, um, I'm blanking on the name of the company, it'll come to me in a second. They reached out to really high-end uh, furniture retailer who didn't have warehouse and retail space in London, in New York. He said, if we made our lobbies basically a showroom for your furniture, send us some of your great pieces, we'll put great catalogs, which look like coffee table books of all your furniture on every coffee table in the lobby. Now people are sitting down, they wanna be in this place. He's like, wow, this furniture is really cool. This is not the Marriott lobby. This is, this is a really cool place. They sit down, they're, pick, they're picking up uh, the catalogs, they're looking through this furniture. And it's, there's, again, there's mutual benefit there. It's um, a furniture company thinking of hotel lobbies as their, um, where, as their showrooms and a hotel thinking about their lobbies as space to merchandise other people's products. And that mutual benefit came and reinvented the way that um, they think about partnerships in, in that space. Um, another example would be, um, it's another furniture example actually, but it involves travel in a sense. So I may have told this story to you, Rick, on, on your podcast, I think, about um, uh, Made, which is um, a UK um, furniture uh, or, uh, company that recognized that it needed to um, show up at the, at the largest trade fair for the furniture industry in Milan. Um, uh, but they couldn't afford the slotting fees, right? They couldn't afford the fees that you have to pay to get on the floor there. But they recognized that they had some people in, based in Milan who bought pieces of theirs. And so rather than have the journalists, uh, you know, go to, this, to the fair and not see their pieces, they put journalists on buses and they ran a tour around Milan, visiting the homes of half a dozen uh, fabulous Milanese with pieces of theirs in their homes. The journalists found that to be a much more compelling experience than being on the showroom floor all day. They got to see some of Milan and they got to see inside the homes. So it's a great example, I think, of um, we don't have the money to afford the fees, but we've got uh, the, the abundant resources in Milan in the form of customers that we could use to kind of... Um, I don't know if that was a travel story, actually. It turned out probably more of a furniture story. But yeah, there's... there's um, well, I have another question if I can ask you, and it's from Robert. You know, you're, you're really you're emphasizing how creativity is born from a constraint and how that is the fuel that the oxygen of optimism. And he was asking any commoditized product can if examples, any examples of the can if application for uh, more of a commodity product? Hmm. Let me think about that. Um, well, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know if this this is a. I, I give it more time. I can come up with a better example than this. But you know, I, I speak about brands and marketing because that's my bias. But um, in the study, we looked at supply chain. We looked at agriculture. So um, I don't know if this really counts, but I'll tell you anyway. But it's really interesting to understand the history of drip irrigation. So we, we were talking to some Israelis and they were telling us that, you know, the, the original um, kibbutzes were always on marginal land. So you could set up a kibbutz there, but it would always be on a piece of land that wasn't really good enough to grow. It didn't really have enough water, but those are the places that, you know, you could get access to in Israel. Um, and Netafim is the world's largest um, um, supplier of, of, of drip irrigation systems, which happened quite by accident, but they recognize that you can actually improve the growth rates of plants by giving them just enough 
but not too much. If you overwater, it actually slows down growth. If you underwater, it's like there's just enough. And so in the world of farming, there are, which is, you know, commodity, you're growing commodities. There's a ton of examples actually and about water use and how to think about the constraint of water, not as an impediment to growing crops, but actually as the perfect way to force you to be creative in how you think about crop rotation and water use. I mean, South African breweries is a big client of ours. And I'm sure you, you may remember that in the headlines a couple of years back, it hadn't rained in South Africa in like two years. And that country was running out of water. And if you're in the brewing business, that's an existential threat. So it set off this kind of examination of, well, do we need barley because barley to make beer, because barley takes a lot of water to grow it. Are there other crops that we might use? And it turns out, of course, that there is. So they've been able to innovate different styles and flavors of beer in South Africa by thinking about how do we approach this idea that we don't have enough water to grow hops and barley? Um, so, I mean, again, it's all, it's all in, in the book there, but South African breweries have been really um, very creative in the face of limited um, resource in, in, in thinking about, you know, the commodities they need to, to, to make beer. This one might hit close to home for you. It's from Eduardo. He says, any ideas on how to redefine the professional services provided by a legacy advertising agency? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I do get asked this question a lot. And I think if I knew the answer, I'd be saying, write me a large check and I'll come and talk to you about it. Um, yeah, I mean, the advertising industry is probably most people on this call have an intuitive sense of has just been massively disrupted in the last uh, number of years by um, all kinds of things from search to um, 99 designs, if you're familiar with that. I mean, they'll outsource logo design anywhere in the world, open source competition. So how do you, how do you redefine the professional services provided by a legacy advertising agency? Um, I would say that you get rid of all your expensive overhead as soon as you possibly can and you go open source. The thing that needs to be at the center which is increasingly undervalued is strategy, which is the kind of conversation that we are having today, which is what's most, in, what are the right propelling questions for my business to uh, ask and answer? Sometimes you can really benefit from the outsider's perspective coming in and helping you with that path dependence conversation, but the center of it needs to be uh, strategy, that's the hub. The spokes that go out to, do I, need, do I need a director? Do I need a writer? Do I need an SEO? That's all out there um, in the spokes run by people who are brilliant at doing that particular thing that don't want to work inside a large ad agency because they'd actually like to surf on Friday afternoons or they're a busy parent and they like Tuesday mornings off to go teach, whatever it is. So I think the way to redesign uh, legacy advertising agencies to break it down into its component parts, let it go outsource, find the best talent, keep strategy at the center. And that's the core offering to clients, help them think it through. The creativity can be outsourced all around the world into all kinds of people. Excellent. Well, we're coming close to the top of the hour. So I want to see if there's any one last question that would uh, you would like to ask of Mark. Uh, Joey Levy had, or, do you see it there, Mark? Yeah, I do. Okay. You recommend creating a new company to compete with your existing company if the new model is too in conflict with the existing one. Innovator's Dilemma. Great, great question. Certainly as a thought experiment, yes. So, you know, a lot of great ideas are born of that kind of skunk works. So now might be as good a time as any to take, you know, a handful of your execs and just say, we're gonna take you out of the organization, move you over here, drop you into a separate metaphorical building like Steve Jobs did with the Macintosh group all the way back then and, and say, how would you make us go out of business and start that conversation? Maybe give them limited resources to do it with so that they're acting like a start. I think that would be, um, if, you, if you have the capacity to spare in terms of intellectual horsepower amongst your leadership, I think that's a very, um, very um, productive way of spending your time. And there's lots of examples of, of companies doing just that right now. 
Um, I'd like to, again, welcome you into our global community, Mark Barton. You are now a thought leader, a part of our community. I hope that many of the people on the webinar today will recommend it to their friends as well as reach out to you for a copy of what you shared with us. So we have two minutes left till the top of the hour. I'm wondering, can you, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Could you leave us with any additional, you've given us a lot of inspiration, but any last parting inspirational shot, thought, something for us to consider as we go forward into our day? Yeah, well, so I, I will. Um, I assume everybody here is a leader in their organizations. And one of the things that people, the mental block, that people tend to arrive with in these processes is a feeling that um, you're born creative. And if you have that mentality and you don't, don't feel like you've been born creative, then you're kind of starting from a very difficult place. So I think the responsibility of leadership today in these difficult times is to convince everybody that creatives are made, not born. And that using some of these tools, some of these frameworks, some of this scaffolding to get started and work people through this process is a best way of convincing them that they can be innovative, they can be creative, they can be inventive. And that's not just a great thing to give them for your business. It's a great thing to get gift to give them as human beings. Thank you, Carrie Ann. I will turn the webinar back to you as our host. Thank you everyone for joining us. I want to especially thank Mark Barden and Rick Franzi for hosting this wonderful chat with everyone. Thank you guys for your wonderful questions. Uh, we will be making this recording available to you as usual on our team by member resource platform. So be sure to check that out and stay tuned for our upcoming expert insights in the month of December. Thank you everyone for participating and uh, we'll be signing off now.